Okay, here we go. Dune Steve in three, two, one. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, issue one, number one, page 88. That's right. This is Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. We welcome you. Every week we've got some stories to share. This week, since we were out of town at the uh, San Diego Comic-Con, we've decided to go with a little bit of a shorter story. The shorter story, of course, will be offset by our extremely long conversation that follows it about the new movie, The Dark Knight. So, as always, we keep it at the end of the file for you so you can skip past it. So, Rish, what's our story today? Today's story is... Spiritual Tripping by Joshua Scribner. Joshua Scribner is the author of novels The Coma Lights and Nescada. He won second and fifth place in the Whispering Spirits Flash Fiction Contest and has published over 30 short fiction pieces. His website is joshuascribner.com. He lives in Michigan with his wife, two daughters, and way too many household pets. Spiritual Tripping by Joshua Scribner. This is better than shrooms or acid. You should get more of this. Callie wasn't sure if Zane could hear her. She didn't even know if he was awake. I feel pretty lucid, but I don't feel very connected to my body. It's like my senses are dulled, but my logic's intact. In the light of the lamp, she saw the blurry image of him getting out of bed. She couldn't imagine how he could walk. She was fairly sure she couldn't. If you're going by the kitchen, bring back some food. I'm not sure I'll taste it, but I want to try. It was hard to tell if the image of him was shaking or if he was shaking. There was a thump and a crack, both of which echoed, and Zane appeared to be spinning around like he was warding off a bee that was circling his head. What are you doing? He didn't answer. He just crashed to the floor. She was able to sit up, but it felt very strange. Wow. It's like I willed the movement and then kind of just teleported. She saw him struggling to his feet. Are you okay, Zane? Not Zane. Not Zane? Don't be insane. I can see you very plain. She laughed. He moved into the hallway. Come back. She said. I'm just teasing and nothing's plain at all. She saw the blurry image of him and watched as he bounced from wall to wall. She willed movement, then felt amazing ecstasy when she went to suddenly standing. There was a mass in the hallway ahead. The mass moved, and she realized it was Zane getting up. Walking was so incredible, she wanted to do it forever. She didn't know why Zane was having so much trouble. She made it all the way to him without falling or bouncing off the wall he was gripping. Here, I'll help you. No! Leave me alone. We'll be fine soon. Why are you talking so weirdly? Am I talking so weirdly too, and I just don't realize it? Am I stumbling and falling all over the place and don't know it? He suddenly lurched away from her. Leave alone. I won't leave alone, Zane. Callie loves Zane. She laughed. That was intentional. Zane moved out of the hall into the dining area. He appeared to turn and then he gasped in horror. There was another thump and crack and Zane fell to the floor. You can't be sure, but that looked like a hard fall. She moved to him. Going down was as fun as going up. She laughed as she lay over the top of him. Are you okay? She asked. I'm back. He said. Get into the hall. Stay away from the windows. She laughed and got up. It felt so amazing. Ahead of her was the sliding glass back door. She saw two things fly into it, but it was like one of them ran right into her. She was suddenly up around the ceiling, looking down at the two bodies on the floor. She felt herself pulled away from those bodies, and then she was suddenly outside, feeling very solid and whole. She looked beside her. 
and saw the outline of a crow, which didn't make much sense at all. Then the crow opened its mouth and spoke. I saw them out the window when I bought the stuff. I didn't think much of it. They've probably been spying on us ever since. Callie looked through the glass and saw the two bodies had moved out of sight. So what do we do? She asked, wondering if a person hearing her would just hear calling. We watch the windows, Zane responded, and hope we can get in before the drug wears off. Author's note. The setting for this story was easy to come up with. At the back of my house is a sliding glass door, beyond which are a garden and a tree. Various creatures, including many birds, but oddly enough never a crow, come close to the door and stare at me while I meditate. The concept and plot developed from my life in general. I've never done a psychedelic drug, but my hobbies include meditation, lucid dreaming, and astral projection. Dabble in these things long enough, and some fun, strange, and sometimes horrifying things happen. And stories like spiritual tripping come about. Finally, Callie. I have no idea where she came from, but I like her very much. I hope you enjoyed the story. Okay, welcome back. Thanks, Mr. Scribner, for your story. That's right. If you're out there and you're listening and you'd like to submit a story for our consideration, as they say, how can they get in touch with us, Big Anchorovich? The submissions address is submissions at doonsteef.com. That's right. There are submission guidelines right on the website. We can that right there. And you will. What? Right there on the thing that you type into and look at the keyboard. And you don't look at the keyboard. You look at the mouse. What do you look at? Uh, monitor, no, you need monitor, the voodoo. That's right. Okay, uh, you will edit all that out, right? Right. Yeah, I'll get that. And uh, the website is www.doonstief.com. D u n e s t e e f. Right, you are. How, it, what, what does Doonstief mean? What, what, where does that come from? What is it's the, the town that I grew up in, in Northwest Territory in Canada? All right. Oh. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. But speaking of stories, B.A., could that be any less natural? Um, (laughs) You and I saw a film over the weekend, and judging from the box office, a ton of people saw it over the weekend, and it was Mamma Mia. (laughs) Mamma Mia! No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Dark Knight. That's right. We also saw the Dark Knight. Usually what we do when we go see a movie uh, is Big and I get together afterward and we talk about it. But because we had to do this podcast, I asked him to save his comments, his ludicrous comments, his worthless, (laughs) pitiable comments, infantile, if you will, until we were recording. So I don't know what he thought of it, although the vomiting gave some of it away, and he doesn't know what I thought of it. Although the wet spot on my seat afterward may have given something away. But now we get to talk about it. All this stuff that's been bottled up. Like the city of Candor. Dorks, if you're listening. <laughs> By Brainiac himself. Oh, ooh, you just, I just implicated proved, yourself. I've proven myself for being a dork. You know, I didn't think Batman Begins was the be-all, end-all of films like so many people do nothing against batman begins it was a good it was a really good film and the stuff that they got right they got darn right i just felt like they took themselves a little too seriously they took some of the fun out of comic book movies or you know and they they planted it firmly in what could really happen and i didn't want to see a batman who drove a hummer and and was in body armor and things like that but because of that and so much buzz okay right here Uh, Richard Schickel of Time Magazine, his review says, and I quote, The Dark Knight is so great, it will make losing your virginity look like testicular cancer. Now, how could any movie live up to that kind of hype? Well, I don't think any movie really could live up to that kind of hype. But but that's exactly the kind (laughs) of hype there was. I don't know if you stayed away from the reviews. 
But I, I kind of glanced at them, and yeah, they were they they were messianic, if that's even a yeah. word. I think it is, and but so I think it's pronounced different. Um, <laughs> so we were going to it no matter what, but I was going up with both hands in a in a boxer stance, and I've been really critical about pretty much all the comic book films. I mean, it's it's very rare that any can come close to what it felt like to read the comic or be swept away or see these these awesome things that would cost three hundred million dollars to put on the screen or or just you know the continuity that you get for reading for years and characters growing and all that stuff. And most of this we will cut out. I apologize, <laughs> but I gotta say, dude, the Dark Knight was awesome. It was smarter and more interesting and more moving. Than I had any idea it would be. Yeah. It took the first one and it took it three or four steps above. Um, God, I don't know what I'm saying. Uh. No, when, when you have an emotional experience or, or a, a visceral experience like we have or like childhood or fireworks or, 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 or testicular cancer or one of those things that is, it's, it's, it's internal. It's really hard to externalize it. It's hard to explain. But I mean, I would imagine, judging from those box office receipts, that a lot of the people listening have seen it. Uh, but if you haven't, we're not going to be super spoilerific, as, or, or are we? No, I, I'm going to try and stay away from spoilers, and I'm going to kick you in the nuts if you start to utter any yourself. Okay, but I might have to put a cup on, because there are some things that you just can't talk about without spoiling things. Like, oh, let's say that we're talking about Batman 89, and you go, well, you know, I just wish that they hadn't killed the Joker. That's right. a valid point, but it's a huge spoiler. Yeah, I don't think we need to spoil the Joker's death because everybody knows about it. He died like eight months ago. <sighs> yeah, I, you know, I have to agree with you. It really was awesome. It was an amazingly good movie. And uh, I know we just said the same thing two weeks ago when we talked about Wally. And I wondered what would now be my favorite Pixar movie. But up until now, my top comic book movie of all time was X-Men 2, which I think just had it all really as far as comic book movies go. But now that I've seen this movie, it just bowled over. Everything was just so nonstop. You know, people crazily can complain about things like that. Like we'll say, oh yeah, there was a lot of boring parts where the characters just talked. This one, it was nonstop the whole way through. And yet in a good way, there was never a time where you're just like, geez, you know, give me a break like you would with something like... Or the Transformers or something like that, where you're just like, Meh. and just amazing plot twists that just keep kept coming and coming and coming and coming. And far different from the first movie, I think, we brought in a lot of characters, and these characters were all important to the story. We had Harvey Dent, we had Jim Gordon, we had... Uh, even uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal's character. Rachel Dawes. Rachel Dawes, right. Took me a second on that one. All these characters, and the character of the Joker, which was a huge character, all the way through. And, and even some of like the mobsters and stuff had uh, a character, to the point where it seems like it was much more of a ensemble ensemble type film. Whereas the first one was definitely, this is about Batman. This is how Batman became Batman. This is... Yeah, I don't think we checked in with Gotham City while he was gone. Not at all. It was all about Batman. It was about Batman's struggles and so forth. This one almost seems like Batman is only a quarter of the... Uh... But somehow, <clears throat> they pulled that off. Yeah. Whereas, like the Joel Schumacher Batman uh -huh. films, where he gets the short shrift... It was to the detriment of the story, and it was just like, oh, let's watch Jim Carrey do his little dance, and let's watch Arnold Schwarzenegger slaughter the English language. With this, it, everybody had an arc, everybody had development, and they all intersected one with another with Batman. Mm -hmm. And it just, yeah, it was so, uh, it, it it was an epic film, man. Yeah, you know, this thing's seriously going to have to get some uh, Oscar nominations, far beyond what everybody's already been saying about, oh yeah, Heath Ledger made a performance of a lifetime, which he likely did. I can't say for sure, because I've only seen a few of Heath Ledger's films. He's only made a few. And 10 Things I Hate About You is really probably not top of his list. I don't know, but that's but one of the few that I have as seen. a testament to how good an actor he was, we believed that he had feelings for Julia Stiles. Mm. But yeah, 
Heath Ledger deserves some sort of Oscar nomination, I would say, but way beyond that, this this could go for Best Picture. Wait till they get a load of me. You know, a lot of times I have a problem because I'm really faithful to the comics, and I, I'm one of those people that says, you know, the book was better most of the time, and when they make needless changes, right, like the Joker killing Batman's parents or... Or the Sandman killing Spider-Man's uncle. Oh, for the love of Stan Lee, yes. The source material is is the way to go. It's the it's the Bible of this. And you guys, just because you're like my dad and you think that they're funny books, you feel like, well, there's no need to respect the source material. But I got to say, some of the stuff in Dark Knight was handled better than I, I have seen it in print. And the character of the Joker, who we've seen in so many different ways whether it is Jack Nicholson or Cesar Romero or Mark Hamill, I have never seen him so riveting and just what was weird was I liked him even though he was completely psychotic and, and all that. Insane. But I didn't like him over Batman, which is weird because many times I feel like the villains are much more well-rounded or much more compelling. I've seen the Joker done very, very well, probably. The Killing Joke is the best Joker story that I've read, but I've never seen Two-Face done all that well. I've, I've never uh, liked the Tommy Lee Jones Tommy Two-Face. Jones. It's awful. And they gave so, so much fuel to the Harvey Dent character that when the flames finally come, <laughs> I mean, it was just this massive fire. And he was, he was so likable. And then what he goes through... You know, his emotional turmoil in this scene. Gosh, how do I talk about it without... I spoiling? don't know. Yeah, it's kind of a spoiler to, to, to mention Two-Face at all. You know, he's in the trailer. And I, I, I Did you see that, his Two-Face in the trailer? No, but you see that he is Two-Face. Really? That they were willing to spend an hour developing Harvey Dent before he became Two-Face made his experience and his agony and his hatred and, and you know his his corruption all the more powerful i don't know i'm a big fan of aaron eckhart and uh spoiler, spoiler alert it's such a shame that we're not going to see him again he was worthy of a whole movie on his own yeah um and i don't know i mean we can bleep that out if you want but that was the one of the things that you know the the original batman movie with jack nicholson in it you're just like oh they killed the joker Nice. Spoiler. Then, oh, they killed Penguin. Spoiler. Oh, they, you know, they always killed off the villain at the end. It's like, why do you do that? Because first of all, Joker and Penguin, they're the two main Batman villains. And when you kill them off, you're just like, okay, now we've got Mr. Freeze. Well, I think it was we've a testament got... to their short-sightedness. Yeah. You know, Luther survives Superman and Superman 2 because Richard Donner planned on making a whole slew of Superman movies. And you get stuff like the three Phantom Zone villains at the very beginning because he knew, well, I mean, he was shooting Superman 2 at the time, that there would be more adventures. And, and that's one of the great things when you know you're in for a franchise, you know you're in for the long haul. Showing a Joker card at the end of the first movie is just, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that we live for, that, that gets those butts, that gets you a $160 million opening weekend. So do you think that they will ever bring back the Joker in a future uh, installment of this series? Get somebody else to put on that makeup and pretend to be Heath Ledger? It's, it's a complicated answer. Yes, I think that they should. I don't know that they need to do it in the third one. Right. But part of what makes it difficult, though, is that this role is already so acclaimed. And I think as the year goes on and people talk about yeah. it and people remember it and go back to see the performance and maybe once award season comes and we start seeing all these posthumous Heath Ledger awards and that it's going to be more and more sanctified, yeah. this this role. And it'll be one of those things where it's like, who would dare right. stand in his shoes? Yeah, that's what I think. And But the Joker is still alive at the end of the Dark Knight. Spoiler. And he is Batman's greatest nemesis. And there are more Joker stories to be told, whether you want to go by the comics or whether it's just this character is too great to leave out. 
I'm sure in the acting world, a lot of people would be hesitant to take yeah, that part. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Who's going who's gonna to have the nuts to go for it? Who's going to be like, yeah, okay, I'll do that, and then be derided for the rest of their life because of it? When he died in January, uh, my cousin, who is really into DC Comics, but he's not really into movies, you know, he, he wanted to know well, what's going to happen, and they, you know, because he didn't know that the movie was done shooting. And I said, they'll probably just find somebody, another young actor with talent and, and, and have him be the Joker. You know, no, no big deal. Because at that point, we didn't know if it's the whole acid bath origin and all that stuff or something that you could explain away that he happens to look different every time. And I told him, well, maybe they'll get like Paul Bettany or somebody that has a similar bone structure and is a young actor that, you know, might do that part. So judging from what I said in January, give Paul Bettany the job. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I really don't know how they'll do it. And yeah, we've seen, especially with the superhero franchises, or, or maybe the best example is George Lazenby and then Roger Moore being James Bond. Mm -hmm. After I mean, those first Connery Bond films were so successful and such a big deal. And I mean, nobody went to see Under Majesty's Secret Service, and I wonder if it had a lot to do with that. But of course, Connery didn't die. Yeah. And help me out here. Okay, they made sequels to The Crow with other actors. Right. Can you think of another situation where the, where we had an actor die? Let's do sequels with somebody else. I don't think so. I don't know. I They're out there. I'm sure there's something out there. Um, think of Richard them. Harris passed away after being Dumbledore in two movies. Right. Um, there's a good one. And I don't know if Michael Gambone had to have his arm twisted to take that role. Chances are no. And again, that's one that's hidden behind the big beard and the big hat mm -hmm. and glasses and all that uh, What's his name? Brandon Routh was Superman after Chris Reeve had died. Not that Chris Reeve was in any position to still be Superman. Right. But I'm sure somebody out there would have asked him, you know, how do you feel stepping into these shoes? I, I don't know. Time will tell. But money is the big motivator. Yeah, if they think they can get money out of it, then they'll go ahead and give it a shot. As it stands, I don't know what should be in Batman 3. I know there should be another Batman. Yeah. I want there to be Batman you know, movies for the rest of my life. You know that there will be another. There will be a Batman three. Movie. Dark Knight two, three. The Caped Crusader. I think they should call it the dynamic duo, and then bam, Robin's in it. Within the year, we will know what it's going yeah. to be called, and we will know what the release date is, yeah. because that's how these movies work now. And and but and I'm fine with that. I really like movies, and I like the anticipation for movies. Yeah, um, which can be better than the movies themselves a lot many, of the times. Many, many times. <laughs> but, yeah, as, if, if I were doing it, I would maybe focus on a female villain in the third one. I don't know if you can do Catwoman so soon after Halle Berry's... <laughs> debacle. Debacle, yes. I maybe wouldn't. I'd let the ground lay fallow a little longer. But, but I was thinking of Talia al Ghul. Mm, she's the right. daughter of Ras al Ghul, and she's really, really hot, and she and Batman have a romance or a relationship or a child, if you subscribe to that story. Um, and, you know, we've already introduced her father. Maybe she's in town for vengeance. She decides to kill the Batman. And they become mutually attracted to each other. Mutually attracted to each other? Or just mutually attracted? Uh, I don't, yeah, you probably could stop at just mutually attracted. I don't know. <laughs> I probably could stop about 20 minutes ago. But, uh, you know, who knows what they're going to do. You could do something like Killer Croc or Bane or Clayface or something like that, some big powerhouse villain that's not all cerebral this time, uh, that, that's just going to be there to pummel Batman because that's very different than what we had this time. Batmite. That's what we need is Batmite. And it will be uh, oh, uh, Vern Troyer as Batman. Yeah, I was going to say Vern Troyer. But I, I do hope you know, that the Ledger's death doesn't deter them from continuing on. I know that when he died, a lot of my friends were saying that people are going to rush to this and it's going to make a lot more money because of Heath Ledger's death. And maybe so, that's so, but something the could movie, be said for that. If, if Ledger were still alive today, I think the movie would probably be still 99% of what it is right now. Yeah. Maybe they would have shot another scene or, or had him do a little bit of ADR work or something like that. I don't think so, though. All of what was so good about the movie was right there on script before they shot it, I think. Yeah, great, man. I hope that uh, gets some sort of a nomination. Although, we talk about how 
much of a uh, scandal it would be to have an animated movie nominated for anything important. And what about a superhero movie? Ugh. I think Ledger's death may have done away with any shame problems you may have had. He died to legitimize his <laughs> Right. Franchise. At least this one. Well, you know, you and I have been around a few years now. It's amazing. We've been around long enough to see a change in the world of film and a change in the way that the awards have gone. You know, it wasn't that long ago that we saw a sci-fi film nominated for Best Picture for the first time. We've was... seen, well, Star Wars and E.T. were both nominated. Or you, we've seen three fantasy films within our lifetime nominated for Best Picture. And we've seen an animated film nominated. And we've seen horror films. Jaws was nominated. Morning! Okay, so what kind of expectations did you have going in? Well, I expected it to be really good. I'd read a, a few reviews where a lot of people said The Dark Knight could be up there with some of the all-time best crime epics of, of our days, movies like Heat or The Departed beside those. So I had expectations of it being really serious, really gritty, and you know, it seriously didn't disappoint. I've always really appreciated Batman's character as, you know, he's the the darkest of the superheroes. He's that brooding, awful, sad person, and he's the one that will do just the worst things, you know. He won't kill someone, we know that that's the one rule, but he will do everything short of it. He would, you know, torture somebody or whatever it takes to manage to get uh, the job done. Batman was made into a joke by the TV show in the 60s, and, and this trilogy, whatever it's going to be, has basically turned that around, although it still hangs around. I mean, I saw a news story about the uh, big box office numbers that uh, Batman had done, and at the end, they throw up a big thing that says, POW, over the screen. <laughs> How long it'll take for Batman to finally live down Adam West. I really, really hate the 60s show, and I hate all of the things that make comic books laughable or that make it easy to mock them. Even if, pardon my blasphemy, it's a big fat guy in a comic book store that says, no, you may not. And all these things that perpetuate a stereotype that comic books are for losers or dorks or morons or whatever the seduction of the innocent said for juvenile delinquents and, and homosexuals and all these things that, that Frederick said. We've gotten these movies, you know, our, our half a billion dollar grossing Spider-Man movie or movies like uh, Road to Perdition or Oscar nominated movies like History of Violence and you know, V for Vendetta that, that are critically acclaimed. And I just keep hoping that someday somebody is going to say, wow, comic books are, are literature. They're not some less worthy, kiddie-oriented form of entertainment. And I feel like The Dark Knight it being so adult and so well done and powerful a film, that may be it. That may help us. I, I, I don't know. Definitely right? I, take step forward. I feel bad that they didn't be forced to put, you know, holy box office Batman or Pow or Zap <laughs> and stuff on the, the article. Oh, yeah. well, you know, there's, there's still a long it's, road ahead. Yeah, it's always going to be dogging at his heels, that poor Batman. This town needs an enema. But, but there were just a couple moments that I, I wanted to talk about. Like I said, I went into it really defensive. I didn't necessarily want to like it. And I just had my boxing gloves batted away again and again until I couldn't lift my arms. And yeah, by the time we got the scene where Jim Gordon went and saw his kid and his kid said, did Batman save you? And he said, as a matter of fact, I saved Batman or whatever. I was totally into the movie. And then in the, the big death scene that came not long after that, I mean, I was just like, holy crap. And, and I don't know how we can talk about this without it being a spoiler. <laughs> but it's something that I need to talk about because it's the other big point besides the Harvey Dent thing that I wanted to talk about. And that is Maggie Gyllenhaal. I'm not a fan of Maggie Gyllenhaal. <laughs> I never have Nor been. I. I just There are some people that I never really understand the appeal of. And Maggie Gyllenhaal was one of them. And yeah. I know that 
a lot of people, I don't know about you, but a lot of people felt like Katie Holmes was the weak link in The Batman mm. Begins. And I don't know how much of that is actual criticism of her work or how much of it has to do with Tom Cruise and Scientology and all this. <laughs> yeah, crap seriously. Here. I can understand it because Katie Holmes does have a little bit of a... Yeah, I She felt... seems still kind of little girlish and, and too nice and whatever for her to be, hey, I'm the assistant DA. Wait, what? No, 20 I years from now way. you might be, but putting Maggie Gyllenhaal in her place... As far as looks go, she's a very pale substitute. And having Joker say, oh, you're an attractive one, aren't you? It's like, no, no, you, you can't say that line and get me to believe I, it. I believe the actual line was, you look like your brother with long hair. <laughs> she doesn't even look that good. Yeah, you know, I was, I was critical of that. It's one of those where it's just like, I don't understand when somebody doesn't come back for a movie and anytime you have uh, like the Harry Potter franchise like 15 faces come back and you're like well that guy and that guy and that guy and they're all the same it's it accomplishes what television series do right. where you have several episodes to tell a story or whatever and the familiarity of coming week after week and seeing these same people you start to feel affection for them you start to feel connected to them and all that and I always feel bad when somebody drops out or somebody doesn't get asked back or, or they decide that they don't need to pay so-and-so X number of dollars to come back or, you know, they replace him with his mother or, you know, whatever it might be. But I gotta say, Maggie Gyllenhaal really won me over, dude. I felt something for her and it has to just be in her, her performance. I think that her acting quality was probably of a higher caliber than Katie Holmes would yeah. have been in the situation. It's one of those things. We'll never know what Katie Holmes would right. have been like in that role. She would have been prettier. Yeah. And we would have had that connection with the first movie. Uh, yeah. But when there's the scene where she's talking to Harvey over the intercom thing. Yeah. I was like, holy crap. And I, I mean, I keep saying holy crap, but it's because I don't have words for when I have an emotional experience like that. And, F it, when they killed her off, I really felt the loss. Even though she's not a character from the comics, she was made up for that first movie, so you couldn't have grown up around her or any of that stuff. But it was just wrenching, and, and part of it is also Aaron Eckhart's performance was so believable. Chris, we believe that Christian Bale loves her, and that was really, really cool. So, I, you know, I know Maggie Gyllenhaal's not listening, and why would she after me saying that she looked like a pit bull shaved? No, I never said that. <laughs> Why Why would you put a piece of paper that said that in front of me? I know she's not listening, but if she were, she really won me over and won my respect. Excellent work. Good on you, as they say. But, you know, speaking of casting, okay, let's say that here comes Batman 3, and can you think of somebody that should be the Joker? I don't know. Uh, you know, it's funny. We could look at, like, a list of people who auditioned for the Joker and didn't get the part, and maybe... That will be an indicator of who they might contact. Somebody that they already have a relationship with, somebody that they know is interested in the part. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who else Who else do we have for Batman 3? Well, you or? could have the Penguin. Okay, the, we've got the Penguin. Who do you cast as the Penguin? Um, Willow Offgood. <laughs> Wait, Warwick Davis? <laughs> well, I guess you could do worse. They <laughs> certainly did in <laughs> Batman and Robin. Uh, hey, how about Philip Seymour Hoffman? You know who he is? Yeah, he's that freakish dude that was in that, like, Truman Capote, you know, right? Right! But he's somewhat heavy set. Uh huh. Yeah, he'll, um, he'll probably He's a be very good. good actor. He's young. He's talented. He's... I could see him as the penguin. Any idea, Talia Al Ghul? Do you, you know what she looks like in the comics? Not that she has to look exactly I don't. like that. But... Okay, we'll just come up with somebody that could be Liam Neeson's daughter. I don't know if she's supposed to be amazingly attractive, you say? Well, everyone in comics is right, amazingly right. attractive. I don't know. I figure you cast somebody athletic. Yeah. Maybe somebody Please. Middle Eastern of some sort <laughs> or, you know, of, of from... You could put on Zhang Ziyi if you wanted to go that far. I don't know. She's the most attractive Asian woman I can think of. I'll she's really of attractive. I, but she's, a, I don't know that she speaks English. And two, yeah, she's, I don't know if people would make the connection with Liam Neeson. Uh, all right, let's say that they bring joker back in batman 3 and we introduce harley quinn <laughs> what do you think who would you cast as harley i don't know quinn? harley quinn is supposed to i think of her as some crazy nut job well like, she's crazy and nutty and all that but holy so cow like she something up. like what joan cusack or something <laughs> why would you say that 
She's crazy and nutty like Joan Cuse. Oh, what, Juliet uh, Lewis? No, 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 no. Okay. Why do you do these things? Here it is. Okay, she's got to be the hottest. Harley Quinn, played by Sandra Bernhardt. <laughs> Why do you say these things to me? When you know I will kill you for <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those things. Who knows? Uh, well, okay. We have wind down. Winded? Can you say winded? You can say it if you want. That doesn't make it correct. But you know what? The way the English language is, you say it incorrectly enough and get enough other people to say it incorrectly with you, and soon it's correct. All right. Well, our show has wounded down. I think that's about it. We'll leave a hate letter of the week until next week, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> but keep those cards and letters coming, folks. That's right. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you have any comments, send them to editor at doonstief.com. Tell or... us who should play Harley Quinn. Yes. Tell your friends about us. And if you're feeling generous, even if you're not feeling generous, if, 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 if you're fighting the urge to just spend all your money on drugs... Click the PayPal button and send us a donation. It would be greatly appreciated. That money will also go to pay writers and to get us something to put these darn microphones in so we're not holding them. Yes, my hand's getting sore. I pressed the button. Oh, that's right. You get to say that. By Oh, wow. I missed my chance. Finishing it off, I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. Warning you that either you die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. <laughs>